thank you so much to everyone who's here. I'm super appreciative and I'm grateful for this opportunity to share about this topic that has uh, permeated its way in my life. This is brought to you by the Sacred Inclusion Network, which is a spiritual community that is cultivated by a few people on the Zoom call. It's led by Angelo. And um, so I'm gonna be giving a presentation and then my friend Arturo in Costa Rica will be leading the discussion aspect. Uh, we have a, a soft stop for one hour, which is 9 p.m. at e 9 p.m. Eastern time. But if we, you know, enough people want to stay, we can definitely go longer. And um, you know, of course, if you got something to do, make sure to handle your business. So first, I want to start with this is like a community night, and usually we start with a grounding exercise. So Tamar, our good friend Tamar, is going to lead us on a quick breathing or grounding exercise, and then we will commence. So Tamar, take us away. Hi everyone, we'll do a short one, not to rob time from the lecture. So <laughs> you are welcome to turn off your camera, get comfortable, put yourself on mute. And you're welcome to close your eyes. And just, you're welcome to turn your attention to your breath. See if you can gently increase the length of your exhale just a little bit. Now I invite you to try to see if you can make your breath continuous. So no pausing at the top of the inhale and no pause at the bottom of the exhale. So a continual cycle. Just like the cycle of the sun and the moon very gently going up and down. You are tuning into the cycle of nature. Your nature, which seems simple, but can be quite challenging. If you feel uneasy, please be kind to yourself. So we'll do one more cycle of inhaling and exhaling. And when you're ready, you can blink your eyes open and come back to the room. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you so much, T, for leading us on that. And uh, yeah, so I want to get started by actually asking a question, get a little crowd participation. And the question is, what are some problems with the way that our current business and economic systems function? And if you'd like to answer, just raise your hand. I'd like to hear from like two or three people, if anyone. So I see trade on, trade on. I'm saying that correctly. Can you uh, let us know what you what yeah. you're thinking? You, you said it. You said it correctly. So so I can uh, hear the question. You, you basically said that. Uh, what are some things that are uh, problems within the business structure? Yes, I would say that the business structure, as far as a uh, collective, is utilizing too much masculine structure within it. It doesn't mm -hmm. have the 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 magnetism of receiving of being able to be open. It doesn't have the being with the doing. So the business is only geared towards the doing, which if a person's not grounded in being, 
then they're not able to come they're not able to meet the universe halfway or god any you're not able to meet energy halfway with that so it lacks a lot it's more so sucking people dry and only giving them the actions and not the being that is acting you know what i'm saying so once business is able to really bring back that feminine essence within it that intuition that ability of planning as well as intuition, flexibility, and utilizing time a different way, utilizing understanding communication a different way, being able to bring the inner child back into it to where you're able to play, you're able to see business as a playful project, you're able to see it as something where you're able to grow because it's a vehicle for you to grow into the truest version of yourself. So once that aspect is added into business, I feel like that will be what propels uh, the collective forward. Wow, that was a beautiful answer. Thank you so much for sharing. Thank you, nailed, hit a lot of nails on the head with that one. Um, is there one other person you'd like to share and try to go after that? If I see anybody, well, you know what? I think that was a wonderful Lisa, answer. Lisa, oh. Lisa had her hand raised. Oh, I miss Lisa. All right. Thank you so much. Hey, hey, Lisa, thank you for being here. I'd love to hear from you. Um, business structure is um, too much on profit. Cool. Way too high of a profit. But that's also because our economy, the inflation, so it should not just be driven on profit alone. And the, um, the structure of the highest paid and the lowest paid should be uh, smaller than, um, than it is now, salary wise. I, I gotta say, I agree with you. And uh, thank you so much for sharing. Love to just hear from the community. So, okay. So first thing I wanna do is that I'll ask everyone if they commute themselves. And then if you would like to say something when the questions come, you are more welcome to do that. So start with muting yourselves. And now I am going to get into a little context, right? So two and a half years ago, I moved to Ecuador with my girlfriend and we were pretty much on a journey to find a deeper connection with earth and to find peace. We met a woman named Leisha who was studying to be a soil microbiologist. And she was already a herbalist, a gardener and a live blood practitioner. And she wanted to start a compost company. And by the grace of God, we ended up in her guest house and living on her land. And we're now helping her start the, this business. And this business is based on a concept called sacred commerce. And it's also a book that she asked me to read. And later I gave a presentation at a workshop that we get, gave, which led to then this presentation. And so sacred commerce is a business philosophy written by Matthew and Tercis Englehart. And they also founded a cafe called Cafe Gratitude, which they source their food from local farmers and their business is based on this unique business model. So this discovery then led me to learn about another book called Sacred Economics by Charles Einstein. And that's more focused on reimagining the entire economy while Sacred Commerce is more focused on running one specific business. So I'm gonna get right into this. I'm gonna share my screen. Yeah. And so do we see something that says welcome? Or now it's moving to can we see this? Uh -huh. All right, perfect. So let's start with uh what is sacred commerce? And as we see, it's a business philosophy and it talks about serving the awakening of humankind, particularly employers, customers, and the community, all while maintaining the bottom line as well. And it's based on the idea that business is actually a tool for entrepreneurs that can, to prove their lives, the lives of their family, community, and the world. And especially when it's applied with a love and respect for Mother Earth and all of life in general. So let's say you wanna run a business on sacred commerce. Your business has to uh, pass a certain criteria. And pass, it's actually an acronym. And the P stands for profit. The A is for awakening, the S is for sustainability, and the second S is for service. And we're just gonna jump right into it. So the P for profit, it represents a love of enterprise, but you know the take on profit is very different than just focusing on maximizing the amount of money you can make that only benefits a few people, right? 
it, it wants you to focus on how you can create value and serve the needs of your stakeholders, but also your customers, your staff, your community, and the environment in a whole. Because so this modern ideology that we live in, we tie our profit to our self-worth. I made a bunch of money, so I'm valuable now. But in B Buddhist philosophy, we call people like this hungry ghosts. And so hungry ghosts are beings who, they have a strong attachment to material possessions or addicted substances. And no matter how much they get, they want more and more and more and more, but it's never enough. And modern day corporations embody the hungry ghosts like no one else, right? And you know we're witnessing what this hungry ghost mentality is doing to us. You know, if you're in Philly or New York right now, you know, I'm hearing about this horrible smoke issue and it just, it really sucks. It's, it's horrible how, you know, something that you can't control really can affect our health. And I feel for everyone who's experiencing this. And, but I also believe that humanity is starting to see like how important it is to make a shift for our emotional, spiritual, physical health and just life in general. So sacred commerce is urging people to see the enterprise as a calling. And it's not just a mission to, you know, get wealth and power. And my favorite part about sacred commerce is that exchange is seen as, or commerce is viewed as a sacred exchange. Um, you know, this, this exchange was seen as an opportunity to honor and respect the dignity and the worth of everyone involved, as well as the natural resources and the environment, which commerce really depends on. So if you nurture your business, you can give livelihood to hundreds, sustenance to thousands, and inspire people to make changes that our world obviously desperately needs right now. So, oh, wrong way. Do that. So the A in PASS stands for awakening. And this guy over here, oh, that, excuse me, that represents the love of transformation. So this guy, uh, this Greek philosopher named Heraclitus, he said that the only constant is change. And so when you start a business, you already have to have the understanding that change is gonna happen regardless and you have to embrace it. And you also wanna understand how things are changing and position your business to be as adaptable as possible. But not only should you see change as inevitable, they challenge you to love the idea of change because everything changes. Um, that's how evolution, awakening, growth, that's how life happens. So it's really embodying change and the two questions for this um, one are, are your employees inspired by their lives? And is your business bringing forth a new consciousness? And so if the answer is no, you know, you might want to reflect and make a few changes. Because, um, you know, if your employees are only showing up because they have to in order to survive, um, let's just say that uh, stagnant water creates mold. And so for the next one, where the S stands for sustainability. And this represents the love for the earth. And when I say sustainability, I'm not talking about like the World Economic Forum's definition of sustainability. I'm talking about what our ancestors practiced thousands of years ago. And it really boils down to treating the earth as a living, loving being, and just showing respect and reverence for the resources that she provides, and then taking action to help her stay healthy. In our business in Ecuador, we do everything we can to mimic nature studying her ways and then we apply them to our lives and the business the best we can. And so the message you see here, I think represents this perfectly that, so we're not defending nature, we're nature defending itself. And I really, really love that. And the question with this one is, is your business a nurturing process to all of earthly life? I think it's a great question. And so the last S is service, which represents the love of community. And there's not too much I got to say about this one. It's, you know, do you love your community or don't you? And how are your actions expressing that love? And the question that comes with this one, which I love, is are you using your privileged position of an entrepreneur to liberate those less fortunate while also cultivating love and in action? And so I know there's a few business owners here. And, you know, maybe in the future we can talk about, so does your business get the pass? That's just like the criteria. But then there's also four insights that they, the book gives you um, if you want to have a sacred commerce business. So let's get into those. The first one is to create a sacred space. And I think, will you agree that the energy that goes into creating space is quite different 
from simply setting up a business. Let's see, thumbs up if you agree or thumbs down if you disagree. I'm seeing, I saw two thumbs up, three thumbs up, no thumbs down. I think so too. Um, you know, we're not quite just setting up a business. It's much more than that. And while you're creating a sacred space, you want to try, you want to feel like you're connecting to the divine. So that when someone walks into your business, they feel like they're getting a once in a lifetime experience. But it's not only about aesthetics. It's not only about aesthetics. It's actually mostly about the energy between the interpersonal relationships amongst your staff, which translates to the energy between customer and client. And a sacred space is fueled by love for what you're doing. Because like the old adage says, if you don't love it, then why are you doing it? And a great question for this is, why do your employees work for you? And how do your employees greet their customers? And uh, the answer to those questions will tell you a whole lot about if your space is sacred or not. And so the second one is being the space for all of it. And so a major part of sacred commerce is a practice called clearing. And I don't got too much time to get into it, but so every day employees ask their, or employees are asked to sit in a group or one-on-one -on -one and they ask each other two questions. One question is a shadow question and it aims to evoke vulnerability and to share feelings about their lives. The second one is a positive question that helps remind them how beautiful their life is. And so in the business in Ecuador, we try to clear with each other every single day because I lost you. What happened? You or your concerns at all. And that energy, that's not the energy you want for your business or really in general. So this is just a great insight for life in general. It's really much saying you have to do the work. You want to live a healthy, fruitful, empowered life or business. Show up for yourself. You got to love yourself if you want to be a channel for love. And clearing is a tool that helps with this process. So everybody here, hey, show up for yourself. We need you. We love you. The universe needs you. This is very important. And the third one is to be in the game. And the sacred commerce is it's creating a business as an opportunity to wait, awaken. And the goal is to have every employee see this business as an opportunity to grow, expand, and live in alignment with their purpose, which is very important. And you want the customers to leave with a, a feeling of like, wow, like, you know, that wasn't an ordinary business. Like that feels different. What are they doing over there? And so this has to do all with perspective. And so since we talk on perspective, I'm gonna tell a quick story. And this is straight from the book that I really loved. And so the story goes, there was a man and two, his two children on a train. And the children are speaking loudly and kind of acting kind of rambunctious. And the man is just really focused, he's in his thoughts. The passengers are looking at him like, can he like shut those kids up? Can he, can he get those kids to relax? And so finally an old lady, he goes up to the old man and she asks if he could calm his children down. The man comes out of his trance, super apologetic. Oh, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. And then he calms his children down, he takes a deep breath and he tells her that they just left the hospital where his wife passed away. And he'd been thinking about how to tell his children. And that, that like, that's, to me, the people, if anyone in the train knew that, they wouldn't be complaining about the noise. Perspective really is everything. And so being in the game is about presence because there's times in our lives where like we have to be present. We have to be in the game. Life is gonna throw some, some stuff at us that's really difficult. So trying to develop a presence that throughout all of life and our business so that we can just be there for our loved one's life and ourselves. And so last but not least is to be an invitation. And we just talked about perspective, which I said is very important. So everybody has their own perspective, right? And it's not easy when two people have different perspectives to try and work together harmoniously, but it is imperative that we try. And you know you don't want to make others feel like they're always wrong or that you're always right. Being an invitation is like is offering a request to participate. You want to try and be an inspiration to help others communicate in a healthy and inviting manner. And you know you want to just create an energy where people feel totally comfortable being themselves. 
because we live in such a divisive, divisive world. And, you know, like say in the corporate community, like the vibe is like, you know, shut off your soul, work for eight hours, shut up and be productive. And sacred commerce suggests that the business can be an opportunity to, to help people settle their differences, to grow and be loving and have open conversations instead of just judgment, vitriol and robotic energy. So that is the, the quick, overview of sacred commerce, um, which is very interesting. So now I'm gonna pop into sacred economics, which the principles are pretty similar, but this per uh, pertains to a whole economy where the sacred commerce was just like one business, right? So let's talk about economics. So when most people think about economics, they think about the study of money or the study of business or what have you, right? But the, so, okay, so I'm gonna read the Wikipedia definition, which is economics is a social science that studies the production, distribution, and consumption of goods and services. But originally the word economics was a lot broader than money. Uh, the word economics actually derived from the ancient Greek word, oikonomia, and it's composed of two Greek words, oikos, which means household, and then nomos, which is like management or law. So the root really refers to the concept of managing one's household or managing of the resources within the household, right? Or the community. And so the Greek definition was a lot more human oriented. Um, these include like the ways that people keep their families together or how families and communities take care of each other or how humans share responsibility to fulfill their needs or, and share their gifts or how communities um, coordinate labor, time, resources, so the community can thrive. And all of that was under the umbrella of economics. And these days, economics has come to mean the study of money or business or products and services. And that is because um, we, we're being consumed under the ideology of money over everything. Like Lisa said, money is the top, and many of our modern relationships have been monetized. So back in the days, people didn't pay for childcare. Like uh, a grandma or an auntie or the community member would take care of your children for free. And maybe there would be an exchange, maybe a dinner, but usually it was just, it was just a community love thing. And like play was not something that a parent would buy for their kids. You, you didn't go purchase entertainment. They would go outside and play with their friends and their cousins, and that was their entertainment. And people would come together and you know, have barbecues or ceremonies with music and dance and games and all the tradition. And now pretty much our holidays are like excuses to not work and to buy stuff. And so, so many human interactions are being replaced with monetary interactions. And so you probably heard the term like people who live off a dollar a day or $5 a day. And have you ever had a thought of like, how is that possible? Like, to me, like that sounds totally impossible, but it's possible because to a large extent, they still live in a sharing economy or what the author Charles Einstein The community like if their house burns down people got together and built another house you know there's no apps to download or gadgets to or that increase their comfort they, they had to spend time with each other and so question so these people do you think that people living off a dollar a day are more happy or do you think that people who live off five hundred dollars a day are more happy and that's just a quick question to ponder. So I don't know the answer to that. You know, there's been studies, but in my experience, the happiest people I've ever met were orphans in India, orphans in Cambodia, and like old ladies living in the slum of Bangkok. And, you know, I, I know the time that I spent with them was like the slightest slither imaginable. And, but there were just so many laughs and giggles and games. And like, they were, it was, it was fun. They were having fun. Now, of course, obviously they like prefer a stable income and access to basic goods. 
but they had community and connection with each other and to their culture and food and they ate together and you know there's relationship with the plants and there's stories and myths about the mountains and the rivers and like that's that is what wealth used to be that these relationships and when you don't have that relationship you need money to get the compensation for what has been lost and so like sacred economics talks about finding a balance so that you know people can have their survival needs met their community and cultural relationships healthy but then there's also time for time and space for passion projects and even creating value for others and making money and so about uh, two more minutes left. So I'm gonna just list off six major concepts of sacred economics, and then um, we can start the discussion and, and see where that takes us. Oh, excuse me. So, yeah. so the first one is reconnecting with the sacredness of life. And you know, that's right along with sacred commerce. It's just acknowledging the, the intrinsic value of all life and recognizing and honoring the independence between humans and the natural life. I think that's something that we really lost and we really need to get back to. Second one is redefining wealth. Uh, you know, it pretty much challenges like the, the narrow definition that wealth is the accumulation of money and kind of encourages a, a broader understanding that includes well being and community and right relationships and economic health. We discussed that. Then there's the gift economy which it actually explore, explores the idea of moving past this ex exchange-based system. And actually even talks about giving, doing things for free and acts of mutual support and generosity. And I know that can be a controversial idea, but that is what the book talks about. And then the fourth one is local uh, localized economies, which I think is super important. It promotes the development of local and regional economies and prioritizes self-sufficiency, reliance, and community cooperation. Uh, that is super important. And then the fifth one is sharing and collaborative consumption. So how we consume things. Are we all buying the same plastic crap in the in houses right next to each other? Or are we thinking about our consumption and trying to be more efficient and respectful to the earth? And the sixth one, the last one is the transition from the scarcity mindset to the abundance mindset. So, you know, there's been this notion of scarcity that says that you know, there's only this much resources and we have to fight for it. But this book instead promotes the idea that there's abundance and suggesting that, you know, if we shift our mindset and we embrace cooperation, we can create a world of abundance for everybody. So, whew, uh, right on target, 731. Um, thank you guys so much for listening. I really appreciate you spending your precious time here with me and everyone in here. And now, I want to pivot the discussion um, to pivot to the discussion. So I'm going to pass it to my friend Arturo. And we got some questions we came up that we want to hear from y'all. And then also we want some time where if you have any questions, you can throw it at us. And so this is time for to stop listening to me talk. And we want to get everybody involved. So um, Arturo, you got you you're live and direct with me? Yes, sir. Good to see you. All right, take Thank it you. away, brother man. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen when I figure out how. All right. Okay, so hi everyone. I am Arturo, new with the network. Happy to be here. So let's get right to it. What are the key differences between the alternative economic systems described in these books and the traditional capitalist economic system? Um, and I'm going to answer and then I'll just let anybody just participate or whatever. Um, I think that in the current system, anything is monetizable. And, and we just like I am very um, unaware of, of this uh, tendencies of uh, sacred commerce and sacred economics. But uh, I did nail on that one because I, I do believe that if we are pretty much monetizing everything and in, in regardless of the impact to the environment and people. So as long as corporations, you know, pay their taxes, anything is monetized. And, you know, that's a big problem. Uh, the primary goal is profit, regardless of the impact to the system. 
And in the new models, these new uh, approaches to handle money and make it sacred, I believe, is that uh, the, bond, the money should be placed in, in best practices. Um, compromising the ecosystem and the well-being of all peoples is should should be a non-negotiable thing. Um, so, Arturo, can you repeat? Can you repeat the question and then uh, throw it out to everybody? Yes. What are the key differences between the alternative economic systems described and the traditional capitalist system that we are in? Is yep. there anyone? Oh, okay. You got Angelo. Well, I mean, I, I don't know, know the whole answer, but um, one of this whole thing is, is you talk about sharing. And, um, you know, um, I'm not a scholar about economics, but I do believe that in older times, um, there was more of an emphasis on barter. You do something, I do something. It's kind of like more human that way. And as we've talked about, everything's become monetized now. And so I think one of the key differences maybe is this thing called money, which is like the thing that that's some sort of means of the exchange as opposed to people and people interaction. So that's my uh, two cents. Anybody else who wants to pop in? If not, Joseph can... James is racing. Oh, oh, um, oh, sorry. Um, can y'all hear me? Yes. Yes. Oh, yes. sorry. It was my mic. Oh, sorry. I wasn't sure. Oh, um, yeah. I was gonna say. Um, I think the biggest difference is uh. Uh, with like regular like regular economics, they never really um, account for like the true cost of anything because if it doesn't really affect like the bottom line, so um, mm -hmm. somebody might um, not have time with their kids. Or a lot of times, people don't realize like they try to make a lot of money over their lifetime, but um, they lose most of their money at the end of their life because they didn't have time to really take care of their health, and so then they end up paying you know all this money you know, uh, to doctors to try to stabilize themselves or try to uh, manage themselves as like they're going to like the last years. And um, yeah, so I think it would, it would probably be, a lot of people would benefit from just like recognizing like the true cost of like, what does it mean not to have time with your family or even like a business or a company not recognizing, you know, hey, if we, um, you know, pollute, you know, that might you know, damage the whole earth. They don't recognize, they're not really paying. They just think like, oh, I'm saving all this money, but they never really consider what the true cost of everything is. It's, that, it's a short-sighted thing. It's only, they only look in within like their time span of, uh, of their business cycle, you know, before the business goes out and they just say, oh, we're going to do away with the business and invest in something else. You know, that's what, that's their time horizon that they're looking over is really short-sighted mm -hmm. well, i'm done i'm sorry <laughs> indeed short-sighted indeed thank you for sharing thank you much uh i, I think tradion uh, raised his hand too yeah yeah i i'm uh Fred, Fred on. Uh, first i wanted to say that i'm i'm excited for being here this is uh i got invited by uh pativa to be here this is uh amazing because i've been this is something i've been contemplating I'll go in a room myself because I'm uh I'm in the arc of 21 of my story. So I'm a part of a younger generation and we're gonna be helping build this new economy. So I feel like what's this con discussion is very powerful to really go into that. And so for me to talk to my peers about. So I would say that the difference between the economy that we have now and the economy that uh that is being expressed within this uh within this community and what's happening here is that the economy only aligns to the material aspect of what is it only uh, constitutes what can be seen which what can be seen is very small if you look at the visual spectrum of what is so it's only based off of sight of uh, physical and not based off of vibration collective and what is sacred and 
what I see is that because of this economy being based off of the physical, it only constitutes and drains the physical essence of what we are, creating concepts like time, uh, money in such a way that it is the blocker in really connecting with someone's heart. I would also say that what it also does, it, it causes people to connect their self-worth to an idea that was created to make things easier, which is money. Mm -hmm. So if you have low money, then you're seen as a lower human being. But if you have all this money, then you're seen as a higher human being. And then you're also seeing that you are expert in 10,000 areas that you haven't actually studied because you know how to utilize your networks properly. Yeah. So I see that the difference is in what is being expressed here is that it's based off of the essence of what it means to be, which is the progression of all, not the progression of I, but the progression of we, the progression of us. And within that, gifts come into the thing. Gratitude, being able to share, being able to really connect with the individual and then also see that money isn't the only currency. Remember someone was talking about bartering, being that if you may don't have this exchange called money, maybe you can barter something. Or maybe you see money as a, as a playful tool to be able to progress in this game of life, not something that is constricting you from accessing every single fiber of your being. So that's really the difference that I see is that this is in a lot of ways uh, piercing through the barriers of what time is, right? Because people say time is money. Well, time doesn't exist. Just like money, the idea of it really doesn't exist. So it's not only just going into this thing called money, but it's going into this thing called human connection. It's going into this thing called perception, right? There's a book called uh, The Game of Status that we utilize physical things as status tools to be able to say that you're better than me or I'm above you. But once mm -hmm. we take this thing called money out of the equation, the way that's been utilized, then mm -hmm. status doesn't become the game, but it becomes the very progression of who you are within your story of what you're here to do. So I feel that that is very much the difference in uh, what we have been utilizing versus what if we were to utilize more of a collective standpoint on the economy, what it could do for us. Wow, well, yeah, thank you for sharing. I do agree and I do believe uh, money is the problem. Um, Money is, 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 is a problem to most of our problems, I believe. So, yeah. Um, next question. So how, how do these alternative economic systems address issues such as income, inequality, and environmental sustainability? Well, uh, just an a better or more even distribution of, of resources for starters. And uh, I agree that the scarcity mind, the scarcity mindset is literally taking us into that direction of, of you know, believing that the world is scarce. I do, I do believe that there are enough resources um, for abundance for everybody. So, Arturo, would you repeat the question for us? Yeah, please. Yeah. Yes. How do these alternative economic systems address issues such as income inequality and environmental sustainability? So, this the systems, these new proposals, how do mm. they address issues such as income inequality? and environmental sustainability. All right, I see Patty Kay. I'm gonna hear from Patty Kay. Well, okay, I, I read a lot of Charles's books, so I know a lot about this kind of stuff only from him, but the new systems require we take care of the earth and we take care of other people. And, and that's really hard in the United States because the law demands that we make money for the 
I mean, that's the way our structure, our laws are structured. I'm all for a new way. I'm just saying, you know, legally, we got to change laws too to get there. And, and, you know, people are becoming more aware of environment and more aware of wealth inequality. We just got to get on our feet and get people in office that'll let it happen. Yeah. Yeah. yeah we're, uh, just, we're not structured that way yet. This the United States is just not structured that way. It was always make money. Big corporations make money for um, their shareholders. Uh, that's where, where you make the money. Uh, and you don't think of um, uh, what it, you know, um, um, what it really represents and, and to help others. And you're right, it's, cha it's changing. It's changing. All I hear on the news is about income inequality and it's getting, the gap is getting more and more and more and more. And they tell us about that but don't seem to do much about it. We really don't seem to do very much about it. No. Well, thank you uh, so much for sharing Patty Kay and mom, that is my mom, Lorraine. Uh, I see Jesse, Jesse. Um, it's your turn, my friend. So I'd say, what if we just pretend that all that system, the conventional system just goes away. Can you mute this all? Yeah. Even though my feet are up and I don't know anybody. Oh, uh, whoever that is, can you put yourself on mute, please? So try to see. You may have heard about bank troubles and such, but I won't speculate about it. I just say, for the sake of discussion, if the commerce, the way it is and the way we're complaining, uh, broke down and it went away. I think the main thing is we'd have to be near each other or know the people that we are near because now we are talking about community interaction and finding the spirit to help each other. So I'm afraid we're all spread out, man. So we have to do this work on our own exactly where we are or we should arrange a meeting place and, and live together, right? So really the systems I imagine as happening, uh, not because there are barriers, but because those barriers go away, which is probably, yes, you know, might be a realistic way to look at it. And that means we have to have some preparation just like this awareness of finding it in our heart to do things like trade on said, uh, you know, the way, way we're talking about. And if we can't get our head out of the books and admit that we already know what to do, if we're ready, <laughs> there are a lot of people who have a lot of land stewardship skills or, you know, other kinds of, uh, things that they've been studying and preparing for. And certainly being close to farmer's markets is an advantage. And you, I like to use farmer's markets everywhere I've been. I've considered them a social event and ways to have community because you're meeting people who are like-minded, basically. They don't want to shop at the supermarket. So they already got some, some notions the way you're thinking, right? So. They got to, yes. So that's all I need to say. But, you know, I think we are really closer. It may be another thing about preparation is not to freak out if we get closer to implementing changes because it's sort of wish fulfillment. If things start getting a little hairy, uh, well, let's say things are hairy now and, and the hair starts to fall out. Uh, you know, when it all falls out, we're going to have to get along. Uh, we haven't been forced into that situation yet. And maybe we're not doing all that well, but it's going to happen. It's going to have to happen. Mm. 
see. Uh, yeah, so okay, I see all types of hands. Uh, thank you so much for sharing, by the way. Uh, I really appreciate that. Uh, how about Jacqueline? You see your hand up? Yeah, um, I want to say that I didn't have the privilege of getting all the information about what was talked about, the, the different options, because I came in late. I had another event. But um, if judging, and, and I thought what Traden said was brilliant. So I want to go back to two things that I've noticed. I'm not originally American, okay? I come from a European country, and um, I've observed this here now, this whole, you know, I've, I've come to the hub of capitalism, basically, uh, 27 years ago, and I've always seen it a little more from the outside. And the one thing that, that I want to um, remind people of is that money is an agreement, an economy, the whole economy is based on agreements. And the reason why revolutions happen in history is because people stop to agree. People simply say, no, we're not doing this anymore. And so um, I, I actually find it really important to step back from all the concepts that we have in our in our heads about economy and money and job because by the way jobs are not work and what is work um so it would be really important to start questioning all these concepts questioning what they actually mean and realizing that that an economy is a social construct that we have agreed to, and we agree to every day with everything that we do. And in the moment, the moment that we go back to a small community, a place where we live, people that we know, and start understanding that economy is actually the way we live together, how we live together, what we do, what each one brings to the table. One, you know, makes shoes and the other one is good at cooking and the third one is a gardener. I think that is the place that we, we, we need to go right now is to get out of that huge idea of an economy, uh, by the way, America rules the world with that. It's just that other countries go, uh-uh, we're not participating here. We're not doing this. And a lot of governments are participating and the people are saying, no, we don't, we, we don't want Chevron here. We don't want this. Um, the Ukraine is an excellent example. What's happening is the American economy has inserted itself and is now running the country basically. So what we really need to do as individuals, I think, is step out of that whole paradigm and realize we have the power to simply not participate and create alternatives on a small scale where we live with the people that we know and with whatever we do every day. Thank you. Wow, wow. I I love that. I like deeply, deeply, deeply agree with that. And you know, we gotta get you on a podium somewhere. Thank you for sharing. Um, so I guess I'll two more. I, I gotta throw my man Joe Jeff. Uh let us know what you're thinking. What's going on, y'all? So um the one point I wanted to touch on, we were um, talking about like, how do, how do we combat uh, income inequality? And I think along with income inequality, what's interesting to look at is like, then like, let's call it knowledge inequality, right? If we apply it to any situation and working with the land, and if we're in this sacred, you know, commerce and sacred economic type of environment, not only are there being, you know, 
you know, there's goods passed on, but there's also knowledge. So whereas in the system where we are now, I can see somebody going, hey, hey, you have, a, you know, you have a store, you have your own shop. It's going to cost something for me to come learn under you, right? So whether I may have a community at home that can profit from, not profit, but that can benefit from, you know, what you're doing or what's going on, we got to go through schools. We got to get trains, licenses. Um, yeah, like you just put into the chat, apprenticeship. Um, it doesn't seem like there's a lot of that going on. And I think that goes a long way in terms of being able to empower us to be able to work within our own communities. Because if there's somebody here that doesn't have the know-how or the ability to, you know, show me, bring me through it, then I have to go outside and I'm likely going to have to pay for it. And then that's going to put me um, back at a deficit. And then um, just talking about some of the differences, um, kind of back to the first question with the, you know, the sacred versus the, the regular capitalism. Um, I feel like there are not a lot of, we don't see the faces or the backstories with a lot of the businesses and people that we spend money with. So, you know, back in the day, you know, Mr. Jones might have been like a locksmith. We know that's his store on the corner. He lives right above it. We know his family. We know he gives back to the community and things like that. So that it, it instills trust where if I come to do business with you, I know that, you know, everything is on the up and up where it's, we're probably going to see it back in our community because you probably are going to spend money with somebody else in the neighborhood or you're doing something to, to uplift us all where as some of these other entities, we send off our money and we don't hear from them unless there's, you know, it's a month, it's, you know, something awareness month. And now we know what they're about. So I think um, those two things, one, just being able to um, share knowledge within ourselves to bring us all up and two, really getting to know who we're doing business with, um, having some sort of transparency um, with, you know, what the money is doing. I know that gets kind of hairy, you know, showing books and whatnot, but just having people understand, hey, you know, we appreciate your business. These are the ways that, you know, we're using your money either to keep our business going or to do something else for the community and uh, forward. My brother, Joe Jeff, I definitely appreciate that, especially the knowledge sharing. And so definitely got to uh, take it home with Tradon. I saw your hand up too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. cool. Yeah. Yeah. Tradon, you got it right. Yeah. <laughs> this, this is amazing. This is amazing. So uh, what I wanted to say, because it was income, equality, and ec economics. So I'm, I'm a big wordsmith as far as what words mean. When I broke down the word income, because I do a little studies on this. Income is a coming in. So it's like breathing. So the first essence of that is, is if you go down to the basic element is your breathing must be in order. We inhale and then we exhale and we have an exchange with the tree that has the nutrients we need when we, when we inhale again. So we have to use that same concept when it comes to income with other people. Other people have resources that we, that we, that we need. Just like some things in the environment have the chemicals we need to be able to stay alive. Some things have iron, some things don't. Some fruits we need at, at some standpoint, some things we don't. When we sick, we need a certain, we need a certain thing, right? So when our business is sick, when our mentality is sick, when our economy or when our community is sick, we need a certain thing. And with that, the value of it goes up. You know what I'm saying? So what that our um the individual before me was talking about mastery of, of skills, having the apprenticeship, having the things which that goes in the aspect of I'm in need of something. You have the knowledge I need. That's competency. I need to learn from you so that I'm able to put this back to my, give this back to my community. That goes into the ancient times where people would, in a sense, they would travel far and wide and they would go find the princess that's out in the, uh, out in the shack. Like, hey, I need to learn carpentry from you. And you go and do that. And then you take that and you go back to your community and then you teach that to them. So it's that concept of conscious, what I, what I thought of when I heard that was conscious networking, knowing that individual. All right, I know what you do. I know what you're about. I want to be your apprentice. Now, how do we do that now, right? We have internet. We have the things like that. 
in investing in individuals that are within alignment with what we are looking to do. That's purpose. Being able to say, you have, uh, you have a purpose that I'm aligned with. I'm willing to be apprentice under you. And then be able to take that information and give it back to your community and be able to help build there. Because the way that some of our communities are structured is we don't have all of the resources we need within our community. Or if we do, some of the individuals aren't doing it within the alignment that we are within that moment. So sometimes we gotta go out and become that person or align that person with that person to be able to do that via Zoom calls. This is decentralized networking right here. It's not under any roof. Everybody can come in here. This is decentralized. So that's already one step right there is creating a decentralized networking space to be able to test this out, if not physically, digitally or both. And so you were talking about the, 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 in, any, uh, the inequality portion that goes into the portion of things are not in the point of awareness. We don't give everything equal attention. A lot of our attention is very narrow versus spacious, depending on who we are becoming in that moment. So if we are hungry, our, our, we are narrowed onto something of hunger and we are now trying to get that. So now something else that is not within our, our I would say in our attention, it's not of equal value. So that goes around intentionality. So we also have to create that intentionality of what we hold valuable to ourselves. Asking the question, what is of value to me in this point of awareness? What is it that I need? What is it that the collective needs? So that you are making alignment within that because everything is, can, everything can be equal, but in a lot of cases, it's not depending on who you are and what you require at that moment. And the other thing is economy, which is the aspect of, I see it as community. A, a wealthy community, what is wealth? Being able to be grounded in yourself, in your sales, in your body, and being able to channel what it is you truly are through purpose and aligning that with other individuals to where it's a chain reaction. There are individuals right now that you sit down, you close your eyes, you meditate, you will heal somebody from across the world. Is that not a value? But that is of a different currency. That is of the original currency. So putting that back into the community as far as with resources, with things, with places, and all of that through decentralized networks, because that's how you build intentionality, we'll be able to build some of these things that we are talking about. And so me being younger generation, how is our generation doing this, right? Discord. Discord is a decentralized network where I'm able to create a server of my own and have anybody in it. All of the kids that I know, my brothers, all of them use these decentralized networks. Why? Because our generation is geared towards, we want our own stuff. We don't wanna do stuff under one person. We wanna create from our own space, our own, our own purpose and be able to do that. Are we sometimes doing it in a messy way? Yes, but that's the, how the inner child works. So that means the inner child has to be put back into this also. The essence of, I want to play instead of be in this space of, it's so serious. So. One way, like to recap, decentralized networks, utilizing some type of decentralized network, whether it's your community, whether it's something digitally, to be able to collectively express these ideas, being able to realize what in this moment, what do you require? For some people, it's income. Some people probably good with income. They probably need more mental stability. They may need something with their community. And being able to intentionally align people with people where it may not be as crisp communication because people are still building out who they are. And some people don't know how to articulate that that well. Another thing, like building the idea of what community looks like to you and becoming that community. For me, Trade On Inspires is who I am. That means that inspires means to breathe life into. That means that I breathe life into anybody that I, that I speak with. So being able to understand who you are, what it is you're looking to do, where you're going to do it, how you're going to do it, and building intentionality, I would say would be perfect. Brother Tradon, uh, I appreciate you for that, that sermon. We definitely got to bring you back. You might have to lead, lead your own one of these. Uh, that was amazing. So First of all, I just gotta thank everybody for being here. What an amazing group of 24 people. So this is our, 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 soft, our soft exit. 
So we hit our hour. If anybody is, you know, they, they allotted their hour, do what you gotta do. Thank you for being here. Um, but if everybody doesn't get off, we still have a solid amount of people. We're gonna keep on doing this. We're gonna see if anyone else has any questions. And before people start rolling out, I do wanna say that this is a sacred inclusion event. This is one of our community, um, community nights. And we do different events. We do explorations with experts in different fields. We do community nights where this is, you've experienced this right now and I'm feeling really happy about this. We also have a mastermind group where some of the members of this Zoom are here and every bi-weekly we meet and we talk about topics like this. We talk about personal topics and how to help each other and we're really becoming a family. So anybody here, um, please, Angelo, just put the, um, the, the link to our, our little online network, but throw your email in here. And we'll definitely, I think like half of the people in here are regulars, half of the people are some new faces or every now and again. Um, if you're new here, throw your, throw your email. Um, and we definitely wanna, we're gonna stay connected in one way or another. Um, other than that, so it looks like we still got 22 people here, we're over. Um, like I said, if you want to pop out, feel free, but I want to throw, are there any questions that anyone has about sacred commerce or anything that anyone said here? And um, yeah, let's, let's, let's see what happens. Okay. Can I make a comment? Yes, please. Okay. Just, I just wanted to say just the fact that we're even talking about this and there's books uh, written about it, things are changing. They really are changing. People are becoming more aware. I think I even heard that like some place like Wharton is teaching, it was all about money. If you go to Wharton, you learn how to make money. Now they have courses about, um, about uh, um, protecting the earth and being more humanistic in your relation, you know, and, and investing in things that, uh, uh, are uh, help the community, you know. So things are changing, uh, definitely, and I think there's more and more situations like this. And people, I just wanted to say one really quick thing. Do you remember um, uh, Thea and Kara? <laughs> yes, okay. I do. Kara's cousins, friends. Kara's husband, Raul. He's in real estate. And you think, oh, real estate, uh, he's out to make money. He's just out to make money. Uh, Raul is um, Hispanic. He's selling, he's a broker. He's selling to minority people, he, just to minority people and just to Hispanics. He's, um, he's supporting his own family. He has a wife and two kids, but he's doing it in a way to help other people, to create wealth for other people. He's not selling million dollar condos. He's selling to people who've never owned houses before, um, given their chance to um, create wealth for their family. So I, I think hopefully, I think things are going in a direction like that. And um, people in your generation are uh, going into business like that, that are, that, you know, helping the community, making the community stronger. And that's what I wanted to say. <laughs> yeah, I wanted to say something, you know, um, all these ideas sound really nice. And I have to admit, I'm very cynical in terms of anything really going to change. Now, I heard uh, Trey Don talk about, you know, and all these n nice things. And, uh, you know, I guess the, the thing that resonated for me mostly was something that Jesse said, and he didn't quite say it like this, but it's almost like, um, you know, if there's a disaster or something starts to happen like that, then we work together, you know? So the question gets to be, short of a disaster, what can we do um, to transition to all these flowery things we're talking about? I don't have an answer, but um, I'm just curious what anybody has to say about that. I, mm, I would say that destruction is needed. Uh, with any, I'm in the military, and one of the biggest things that they teach you is that, um, you know what I'm saying, you have to break something down to build it back up. 
So in a lot of cases, there needs to be a disruption of some sort and probably other disruption so that the pain is able to be transferred into gold. This is what the alchemists did where they turned lead into gold. It took pain, it took suffering, it took all of these things that we perceive negative to be able to build something. So with everything that I'm saying, I'm also saying that I'm willing to go through the disruption, the disruption and destruction needed to be able to make that happen. Because I see that within what we have built, there has to be that. There has to be some disruption. There has to be people getting down and getting down in the dirt and really building in the trenches this. Because um, we, have, we have stacked all of these concepts layered on top of what's been buried underneath. And they always say that uh, in order to reach heaven, you have to put the roots down to hell. We have a lot of shadows that were that are created be, uh, that are created that are intertwined with this economy and what's happening. And for those shadows to be illuminated, there will be, in a lot of ways, a fight that will have to happen in order for that to happen. And we see that that's happening with wars and everything like that. It's a part of the story. If you ever go to a movie, this is how the this is how the essence of the story goes, is that there is some disruption before there's some upbringing that happens. But it's how you perceive that disruption. That's how you perceive that that bad thing. That's going to determine if the community or the individuals are going to build through it and really make happen what we are looking to make happen. Man, I love the passion. I absolutely love the passion. And I, I agree with most of what you're saying. I do want to open it up. Anyone else, some other voices who maybe hasn't spoken yet or just wants to pop in? Um, Hi, Ian. <laughs> it's hey, Lori. Lori. So nice to see you. Yes, yes, yes. I think, I think I have to have a little bit of a contribution. I think I have to speak here. First of all, I'm just, I'm going to say that Perhaps we need destruction to rebuild, but I also say, please be careful about what you ask for. Mm. And I say that um, only because of the experience that I'm having, that I'm living through at the moment um, in the last what, month. Ian is well aware of my experience. And um, as you can see, I'm of a certain age, and my whole financial world was complete, completely blew up about a month ago. And I truly have no income. I also have no home because I was invested in certain things that I was led to believe were safe or was a way for me to build a little bit more so that I could share and I could have other things in my life. And um, so no home and no income. But what I do have and what I've experienced is this incredible community of care. And whether we go through hard times or whether we don't, whether we have to get to the bottom of the barrel or the bottom of the well, or we don't, we still are just human beings who can share and can care. And through the sharing and the caring, I believe is where we start developing new communities, new um, ways of living, new ways of how we can see economics, new ways of how we can see how we might um, share our skills um, with others and have them share theirs back. And as I said, I don't have a whole lot, but what I do have is incredible people in my life who have offered me homes. Um, some people have offered me money and I, I just know I'm gonna be okay because I just know that there is this community of care. And so when we talk about redeveloping and redesigning and having things bro broken up, we still need to start living through our hearts and through our care of each other and first and foremost through the care of ourselves and how 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 is that really going to look um i really appreciate um I, I came in late and i have to apologize for that but i really appreciate the 
the person who was sharing at the time when I did come in saying that, um, you know, younger people really kind of want to be in charge and in control of their skills and their abilities. And I really applaud that. I think that that's really brilliant. It's responsible. Um, and it's, um, we have to know who we are and what we can share to develop a new community and a new way of being in our world. And having you honor that in yourself, then you will honor that in other people. And then we'll start to realize that maybe everyone really has something really significant to share with us, no matter who they are, where they are, and where they live. That it is in the sharing and the caring, again, um, that we will start to see things anew because we need to. And I'm hoping that it doesn't have to be through destruction, even though I've lost everything. Um, I don't know that it really would have taken that for me to see this. I, I don't, I, I'm learning a whole lot, obviously, but what I've really learned a lot in the last is how much I believe that money um, helped me through my life. So what I mean by that is if I had money, I could make this decision. If I had money, I could go to this school. If I had money, I could buy this pair of shoes. If I had money, I could buy this car. If I didn't have money, then I couldn't have that car. And I realized, and I am realizing more and more how much, um, how, how much, you know, how much money ruled and who I was. And it has nothing, who I am in this world has nothing to do with money, absolutely nothing. It has everything to do with who I am as a person, how I care, how I share, and how I'm choosing to be a responsible person in this world. And that that is the highest value of anything. There's no limitations on that. If we live that, each, each of us for ourselves and then within the community, money has huge limitations, huge. Can I go to that school? Nope, can't, haven't got enough money to do that. Can I do this? Can I do that? Can't start this project because I need X number of dollars. It is the most limiting factor in our whole life, in our whole way of being. Nature never limits us. Nature also doesn't say hoard and collect and keep a big fat bank account for one day because I've worked so hard. Me, I'm speaking about me here. I worked so hard my whole entire life. And so I have, of course, I, I felt that, you know, I should, should collect, you know, hoard, have money. And not that we don't need it because we do. Um, but that, that, I, the, the value I had on that, that that was everything. Nature never does that. Nature will always give you everything that you need at every moment if you're open, if you're ready to receive, if you're happily receiving. So I just can't emphasize enough how limiting money is, how destructive money is, how judgmental money is um and i you know obviously we could go on and on and on uh, uh, about that so i guess what i'm saying most is find out who you are find out what your heart is saying because it'll say something to you every second and act on that but know your heart that's where the gold is that's where everything, everything is developed out of that one single spot, if we can call it a spot within our body, but it is our universe, and everything flows and follows from there. So I feel really lucky. I'm so grateful. I've had so many friends offer me a place to live, so I didn't and won't be on the street. I have everything. I have food. I have really good friends. I have my health and I have a place to sleep. And for me, I have a lot. And who knows where I'm going to go from here? Well, Lori, uh, 
It's just so beautifully said, passionate from your heart. I'm so appreciative you just you came, even though you came late and shared with us. And thank you so much for sharing, you know, the personal details. I know that really, I felt that. I feel you. I appreciate you. Um, so we got about 12 more minutes. Hey, I'm going to, th Tamar, I saw you pop on your screen. Um, th does that mean you want to say something? If not, the floor. He's on me. Oh, uh, well, no, Tamar, Tamar, Tamar. Tamar. Oh. Yes, that's close. T number two. So, wow, um, what a great, what a great, uh, what would you call this workshop presentation? It was really, really good. Thank you for putting this on. Um, loved what Lori said. Loved what everybody said. Um, I'm just thinking, and what came to me was. I think I keep coming back to this feeling of fear versus love and what it means to follow with with love and, and the fear is going to be a part of our lives but actions led through love versus action led through fear and I think for some of us for me, for sure, growing up in with certain comforts, there is this, you know, where especially Western culture, they tell us fear, fear, discomfort, right? Everything is about avoiding discomfort, including from painkillers um, to, I don't know, bidets <laughs> is, is what I thought of. I don't know why. Um, I don't know if you can hear the pups. Apologize, apologies for that. Um, but yeah, I just just thinking of like we're told that if we lose the comforts, then you know that's that's gonna that's like a part of us will shatter. Um, and our work is to come back into the comforts. And and Ian and I live in 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 this room with without electricity it's solar panel um and we go to the bathroom in a hole it's so basic and it's my favorite place i've ever lived in by far we barely have to clean it's so awesome and it's just so simple i there's something beautiful about shedding shedding the that fear of of not having the stuff and like Lori said you know I know Lori's going through a hard time really hard time and facing some of these things um and I think to to your point Lori it's it's like it's the people right it's the people that carry us it's the interdependency it's the feeling that we can depend on someone and they can depend depend on us and a life without responsibilities is is pretty meaningless so it's not bad it's not a bad thing to feel like we have we have this great response care of the for the earth like take care of her and then take care of each other because it's so meaningful it's so meaningful and that alone is kind of a relief. It's a life of purpose. Um, I'm rambling, but I, I, I'm just, I think about this a lot and I'll, I'll keep it short. Just like fear versus love. It's like, if you, if you love what you're doing, it's not that scary to die. Even there, I say, I think capitalism is such a, machine that's afraid of death right it's always growth oh you know we're gonna live forever type of like energy <laughs> um and meanwhile it's destroying the earth so that's there's like so much irony there that um i think is is kind of like beautiful to look at where it's like you're shortening your own life by participating in that thing um but then again it's also what's fueling 
a lot of this of that kind of society is like um I think the fear of death and so um I don't know I I I think about this a lot like what would would I rather live somewhere with all the comforts of modern life uh and 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 the disconnection um from my culture you know my original culture my neighbors nature where my water comes from my body uh till till an advanced age or you know risk it quote unquote um and try something else and potentially you know not not live for that long it's like i don't know i choose i think i will choose discomfort quote unquote in the hopes of interdependency and i think that's what i go back to the idea of of connection to nature um and people talk about oh reconnecting with nature and it's like we are nature we are that so it's it's so absurd in a way to think like i go to the forest to reconnect with nature it's like no but i am nature. like we are a reflection of everything the fire water air ether um and earth and so it's just whether or not we see it and make it our purpose to be it kind of i don't know that's what i've been thinking about and thank you this has been really nice thank you tabby lee tabby lee i want to hear her voice i'm just here soaking everything in you know um thank you for uh, holding this space. Um, I've just heard some great things from Trade On um, and, you know, multiple other folks who have spoken, um, just uh, all of it important. Um, like Angela said, I don't know if I have an answer or even a suggestion or a solution, um, but there are many um, things that we can be doing. And this just gave me a pause in thinking about my own personal things I'm navigating. Um, and how am I viewing income? How am I um, viewing economy? And um, how am I leaning into my local communities um, and offering my skills um, in a way that's meaningful for people uh, before anything drastic has to happen to make it so? So that just that just struck a chord with me um, as we think about like how will this change take place? What will it take to make a shift? And I'm I'm a little bit on that same side. It's going to have to take something drastic. We we were all so embedded and so comfortable um, where we are. Uh, even those of us who talk about change and want change, um, that I think it's going to take something something drastic to make us come together and remember why we're here as human beings um, and what we need to do uh, to really support each other in meaningful ways. So that's just I just have a lot more questions. Um, and things to reflect on and, and some actions to take from my side of things. Hey, uh, thank you so much for sharing. T. Lee, my dog. Um, I, I see Avery pop, Avery and Mary pop on the screen. So might, might as well take us home. <clears throat> no, thank you guys so much for, for all that sharing. You definitely have given us a lot to think about, so much to think about. And like, it definitely um, inspires me and motivates me to spend more time thinking about this. And um, Mary said something really, really powerful. She said, you know, to think about creating spaces for like um, opportunities for us to nurture our nature in the city, which mm -hmm. is like, I feel like that's like definitely a, a great first start, you know? Yeah, it's like, hard though. It's hard, you but. Can feel, I feel like you can feel disconnected from yourself because like Tamara was saying about like, we are nature. So it's like sometimes living in the city, you feel like that disconnect, I feel like. I but very often. And like, I don't know, it's just really good to have us right here. You created a space for us to think about this and 
really like reflect on it. And I really appreciate that. And I appreciate all the knowledge that you guys have bestowed upon us tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Abe, for chiming in. And Mary, it's so good to see your faces. Um, so yeah, I, I'm going to wrap it up. I'm actually, if you guys uh, are okay with me going maybe two minutes over the hard stop deadline, I just want to know, has anyone ever heard of the Wargle miracle? Raise your hand if you've heard, anyone has heard of the Wargle miracle. So, okay, cool. So I'm going to leave with a little uh, historical con concept, not concept. Some history, let's say. So, okay, so Wargo is a town in Austria. And when Hitler took over, Germany annexed Wargo. And all of a sudden, they were struggling with the economy. They didn't have resources. Like, shit was falling to pieces. And so the mayor tried this local currency. And they called it the, the Fregeld. I'm saying that wrong. And it was based off a specific economist. And so the introduction of this local currency totally changed this whole town. Uh, within weeks, economic activity boosted, unemployment went down, shops and businesses were flourishing, and this experiment gained a lot of attention outside of this small Austrian um, community. And it's really interesting because all they really did was they made a pact that we're going to shop local, spend our dollars within our town, and then have the trust that other people will also shop with us. And just like that, the economy, it was just like totally, there's a documentary about it, super interesting. Now, of course, the Austrian Central Bank shut that down with the help of Hitler real quick. And, you know, that wasn't, that, that, that only thrived for maybe a few months or a year. But I just think that's a really interesting historical reality that people actually did to try to do this. And it was a success. It was in 1933, 90 years ago, it's crazy. And there are communities that are moving in this direction with even, even where I'm at, um, a friend of mine is, is leading the charge to start a local currency. So it has happened. There's places called Kinsale, Ireland, even in um, Ithaca, New York, um, which so to, to, to kind of follow what my mom said, change is happening um, and yes, thank you all for being here. Thank you for staying the whole hour and a half. 8.30 on the dot. I love y'all. Uh, thank you, Angelo Toro. Thank you, Tradon. Love what you had to say. T. Lee, Avery, Lori, Tamar, Ken, Patiba, Kulani, popping at the end. And Lisa, come back to Ecuador. Love y'all. Um, yeah, let's be in touch, every last one of you. And uh, we hope to see you more. There's going to be more of these. This is not the only one. So I'm going to be bothering y'all to come and share Share the love and the wisdom. So have a great night. Thank you for staying so long. And um, yeah, until next time, we really love and appreciate you. Peace.